here we are at the beginning of our journey and I've decided to start with Women Who Run With The Wolves by Clarissa Pinkler Estes. It's a profound book and I've been quite moved by it. I'm only a third of the way through and I feel called to document it and do the work and put it here on YouTube for not just myself, but for anybody else who resonates with the creative self, with uncovering or recovering the artist. Uh, perhaps you've lost her along the way. I know I have. And it's taken me years to finally get back to her and a yearning, a deep yearning inside that I never had a name to call her until I started reading this book and understanding what the wild woman archetype truly is. And uh, Clarissa has done an incredible job excavating her and putting together this workbook for us to do the same and to find our inner creative and unleash her to the world and for ourselves, for our own joy, for our own uh, fulfillment. And this is why I'm here doing it and I really hope you join me on this journey and enjoy, enjoy the, the adventure that lies ahead. I'm going to start with chapter one, actually not even chapter one, the introduction. I'm going to read some excerpts from, from the introduction that will give us an idea of what the wild woman archetype is and how we've lost her in our lives. And maybe you'll resonate with it and be called to join me on this journey. So without further ado, let's get started. The title of this book, Women Who Run With The Wolves, Myths and Stories of the Wild Woman Archetype, came from my study of wildlife biology, wolves in particular. The studies of the wolves Canis lupus and Canis rufus are like the history of women regarding both their spiritedness and their travails. So that is where the concept of the wild woman archetype first crystallized for me in the study of wolves. Although I did not call her by that name then, my love for wild women began when I was a little child. I was an athlete rather than an athlete. And my only wish was to be an ecstatic wanderer. Rather than chairs and tables, I preferred the ground, trees and caves. For in those places, I felt I could lean against the cheek of God. The river always called to be visited after dark. The fields needed to be walked in so they could make their rustle talk. Fires needed to be built in the forest at night and stories needed to be told outside the hearing of grown-ups. My own post-World War II generation grew up in a time when women were infantilized and treated as property. They were kept as fellow gardens, but thankfully there was always wild seed which arrived on the wind. Though what they wrote was unauthorized, women blazed away anyway. Though what they painted went unrecognized, it fed the soul anyway. Women had to beg for the instruments and the spaces needed for their arts. And if none were forthcoming, they made space in trees, caves, woods, and closets. Dancing was barely tolerated, if at all. So they danced in the forest where no one could see them or in the basement or on the way out to empty the trash. Self-decoration caused suspicion. Joyful body or dress increased the danger of being harmed or sexually assaulted. The very clothes on one's shoulders could not be called one's own. It was a time when parents who abused their children were simply called strict. When the spiritual lacerations of profoundly exploited women were referred to as nervous breakdowns, when girls and women who were tightly girdled, tightly reined and tightly muzzled were called nice, and those other females who managed to slip the collar for a moment or two of life were branded bad. 
So like many women before and after me, I lived my life as a disguised creatura, creature. Like my kith and kin before me, I swaggered, staggered in high heels and I wore a dress and hat to church. But my fabulous tail often fell below my hemline and my ears twitched until my hat pitched, at the very least, down over both my eyes and sometimes clear across the room. I've not forgotten the song of those dark years, the song of the starved soul, but neither have I forgotten the joyous canto ondo, the deep song, the words of which come back to us when we do the work of soulful reclamation. Like a trail through a forest, which becomes more and more faint and finally seems to diminish to a nothing, traditional psychological theory too soon runs out for the creative, the gifted, the deep woman. Traditional psychology is often spare or entirely silent about deeper issues important to women. The archetypal, the intuitive, the sexual and cyclical, the ages of woman, a woman's way, a woman's knowing, her creative fire. This is what has driven my work on the wild woman archetype for over two decades. A woman's issue of soul cannot be treated by carving her into a more acceptable form as defined by an unconscious culture, nor can she be bent into a more intellectually acceptable shape by those who claim to be the soul bearers of consciousness. No, that is what has already caused millions of women who began as strong and natural powers to become outsiders in their own cultures. Instead, the goal must be the retrieval and succor of women's beauteous and natural psychic forms. I can really relate to that. I can see how myself starting out as a strong young woman, slowly beaten down by my culture and society and boxed in and yeah, it's so easy to lose one's path and one's way. Please excuse my dog who is not very well settled. Nikki, come on darling, lie down. She insists on being here with us. When women hear the words, an old, old memory is stirred and brought back to life. The memory is of our absolute undeniable and irrevocable kinship with the wild feminine, a relationship which may have become ghosty from neglect, buried by over-domestication, outlawed by the surrounding culture, or no longer understood anymore. We may have forgotten her names, we may not answer when she calls ours, but in our bones we know her, we yearn toward her, we know she belongs to us, and we to her. It is into this fundamental, elemental and essential relationship that we were born, that in our essence we are also derived from. The wild woman archetype sheathes the alpha matrilineal being. There are times when we experience her, even if only fleetingly, and it makes us mad with wanting to continue. For some women, this vitalizing taste of the wild comes during pregnancy, during nursing their young, during the miracle of change in oneself as one raises a child, during attending to a love relationship as one would attend to a beloved garden. I know for me again, <laughs> it's come after motherhood. Prior to this, I had this book sitting on my bookshelf for 13 years and only last year did it leap out at me and uh, and I read it and I finally got it. 13 years ago, I tried to read it and it did not resonate. It didn't even call to me. And now after motherhood, after raising my children, after the dramatic shift in one's own psyche from woman to mother, it's, it's quite profound. And this now I understand and I'm able to name her now and... It's exciting. I know I keep saying that, but this journey is so essential to um, an enriched, fulfilled life. 
A sense of her also comes through the vision, through sights of great beauty. I have felt her when I see what we call in the woodlands a Jesus God sunset. She comes to us through sound as well, through music which vibrates the sternum, excites the heart. It comes through the drum, the whistle, the call and the cry. It comes through the written and the spoken word, sometimes a word, a sentence or a poem or a story is so resonant, so right, it causes us to remember for at least for an instant what substance we are really made from and where is our true home. These transient tastes of the wild come during the mystique of inspiration. Ah, there it is. Oh, now it has gone. The longing for her comes when one happens across someone who has secured this wildish relationship. The longing comes when one realizes one has given scant time to the mystic cook fire or to the dream time, too little time to one's own creative life, one's life work or one's true loves. Once women have lost her and then found her again, they will contend to keep her for good. Once they have regained her, they will fight and fight hard to keep her. For with her, their creative lives blossom, their relationships gain meaning and depth and health. Their cycles of sexuality, creativity, work and play are re-established. They are no longer marks for the predations of others. They are entitled equally under the laws of nature to grow and to thrive. Now their end of the day fatigue comes from satisfying work and endeavors, not from being shut up in too small a mindset, job or relationship. They know instinctively when things must die and when things must live. They know how to walk away. They know how to stay. And again, this is true of my journey. I know through bad choices in relationships, how I've really lost my connection to my creative self and that fire within me that drives and motivates me to create. So this is another part of the journey. When women reassert their relationship with the wildish nature, they are gifted with a permanent and internal watcher, a knower, a visionary, an oracle, an inspiratress, an intuitive, a maker, a creator, an inventor, and a listener who guides, suggests and urge vibrant life into the inner and outer worlds. When women are close to this nature, the fact of that relationship glows through them. This wild teacher, wild mother, wild mentor supports their inner and outer lives, no matter what. So the word wild here is not used in its modern pejorative sense, meaning out of control, but in its original sense, which means to live a natural life, one in which the creatura, creature, has innate integrity and healthy boundaries. These words, wild and woman, cause women to remember who they are and what they are about. I myself have just learned how to set clear boundaries. It's taken me 44 years <laughs> to really learn it. And it's taken a very bad abusive relationship um, to really learn how to set healthy boundaries and how liberating it is, as difficult as it is to do so when one is not used to this. Um, it is very liberating and, and empowering. The comprehension of this wild woman nature is not a religion, but a practice. It is a psychology in its truest sense, psych, soul, ology, a knowing of the soul. Without her, women are without ears to hear her soul talk or to register the chiming of their own inner rhythms. Without her, women's inner eyes are closed by some shadowy hand and large parts of their days are spent in a semi-paralyzing ennui or else wishful thinking. Without her, women lose the sureness of their soul footing. Without her, they forget why they're here. They hold on when they would best hold out. Without her, they take too much or too little or nothing at all. 
Without her, they are silent when they are in fact on fire. She is their regulator. She is their soulful heart, the same as the human heart that regulates the physical body. Without her, they are silent when they are in fact on fire. She is their regulator. She is their soulful heart, the same as the human heart that regulates the physical body. When we lose touch with the instinctive psyche, we live in a semi-destroyed state. When a woman is cut away from her basic source, she is sanitized, and her instincts and natural life cycles are lost, subsumed by the culture or by the intellect or the ego, one's own or those belonging to others. Wild woman is the health of all women. Without her, woman's psychology makes no sense. I believe that all women and men are born gifted. However, and truly, there has been little to describe the psychological lives and ways of gifted women, talented women, creative women. There is, on the other hand, much writ about the weakness and foibles of humans in general and women in particular. But in the case of the wild woman archetype, in order to fathom her, apprehend her, utilize her offerings, we must be more interested in the thoughts, feelings, and endeavors which strengthen women and adequately count the interior and cultural factors which weaken women. In general, when we understand the wildish nature as being in its own right, one which animates and informs a woman's deepest life, then we can begin to develop in ways never thought possible, a psychology which fails to address this innate spiritual being at the center of feminine psychology fails women and fails their daughters and their daughters' daughters far into all future matrilineal lines. We're so fortunate to live in the time that we do with the internet and YouTube and so many people on similar journeys which allow us to be exposed to these learnings and this community and to support each other and grow together, learn from each other. It's um, a very blessed time in a woman's and men's psychology or lives in general. What are some of the feeling toned symptoms of a disrupted relationship with the wildish force in the psyche? To chronically feel, think or act in any of the following ways is to have partially severed or lost entirely the relationship with the deep instinctual psyche. Using women's language exclusively, these are feeling extraordinarily dry, fatigued, frail, depressed, confused, gagged, muzzled, unaroused, feeling frightened, halt or weak, without inspiration, without animation, without soulfulness, without meaning, shame-bearing, chronically fuming, volatile, stuck, uncreative, compressed, crazed, feeling powerless, chronically doubtful, shaky, blocked, unable to follow through, giving one's creative life over to others, life sapping choices and mates, work or friendships, suffering to live outside one's own cycles, overprotective of self, inert, uncertain, faltering, inability to pace oneself or set limits. I know I can tick a few of those that were listed there. <laughs> I can definitely relate to being stuck and uncreative, compressed and and yeah, unable to follow through and and without realizing that it's this lost creative within, this lost connection to the wild woman, you begin to think something's wrong with you or blame yourself or shame yourself for not being fully realized and successful or, you know, whatever the expectations we place on ourselves that we've learned through our culture and society. So this is comforting to know and to realize that this is what 
happens when you lose your connection to your creative self, your wild woman. Not insistent on one's own tempo, to be self-conscious, to be away from one's God or gods, to be separated from one's revivication, drawn far into domesticity, intellectualism, work or inertia, because that is the safest place for one who has lost her instincts. To fear to venture by oneself or to reveal oneself, fear to seek mentor, mother, father, fear to set out one's imperfect work before it is an opus. I know I have that. <laughs> and that comes from art school, or possibly before, but being an empath, one is quite sensitive. And then being an artist and having to put your work out there, you have to have quite thick skin to do that. So the two are quite challenging to uh, interlink, to <laughs> embody empath and artist, find a way where you can confidently put your work out and not be shamed or uh, fear of criticism. I know at art school we used to, at the end of each uh, project, have our work displayed and then the group or the class would get together and each person would give their personal criticism. And I used to cringe and hate those days. And I think that partially affected me in terms of not taking my art further and fear of putting my work out there when I should have been bold enough just to do it. But again, one is sensitive, especially when you're younger and sensitive to criticism. As one gets older, there is a, a beauty about getting older in that you stop caring what people think <laughs> and you start to really uh, examine your life and live your life the way you wish to be as the person you are. You're discovering who you are. And by the time you reach your 40s, it's a beautiful time. I'm really glad to be here because I'm learning so much about myself, who I am, and letting that fear go that used to stop me from doing a lot of things. I wouldn't wish to go back to being in my 20s. I'm quite happy here. And... This is my first uh, painting that I did recently, first oil painting in eight years. So I've been working through this book slowly and already I can see it's taking effect. It's starting to have an effect on my psyche and unearthing this wild woman and starting to create. It's wonderful. <laughs> afraid to stop, afraid to act, repeatedly counting to three and not beginning superiority complex, ambivalence, and yet otherwise fully capable, fully functioning. These severances are a disease not of an era or a century, but become an epidemic anywhere and any time women are captured, any time the wildish nature has become entrapped. A healthy woman is much like a wolf, robust, chock-full, strong life force, life-giving, territorially aware, inventive, loyal, roving, yet separation from the wildish nature causes a woman's personality to become meager, thin, ghosty, spectral. We are not meant to be puny with frail hair and inability to leap up, inability to chase, to birth, to create a life. When women's lives are in stasis, or filled with ennui, it is always time for the wildish woman to emerge. It is time for the creating function of the psyche to flood the delta. How does wild woman affect woman? With her as ally, as leader, model, teacher, we see not through two eyes, but through the eyes of intuition, which is many-eyed. When we assert intuition, we are therefore like the starry night, we gaze at the world through a thousand eyes. The wild nature carries the bundles for healing. She carries everything a woman needs to be and know. She carries the medicine for all things. She carries stories and dreams and words and songs and signs and symbols. She is both vehicle and destination. The wild nature has a vast integrity to it. It means to establish territory, 
to find one's pack, to be in one's body with certainty and pride, regardless of the body's gifts and limitations, to speak and act in one's behalf, to be aware, alert, to draw on the innate feminine powers of intuition and sensing, to come into one's cycles, to find what one belongs to, to rise with dignity, to retain as much consciousness as possible. The archetype of the wild woman and all that stands behind her is patroness to all painters, writers, sculptors, dancers, thinkers, prayer makers, seekers, finders, for they all are busy with the work of invention, and that is the instinctive nature's main occupation. As in all art, she resides in the guts, not in the head. So what comprises the wild woman? From the viewpoint of archetypal psychology, as well as in ancient traditions, she is the female soul, yet she is more. She is the source of the feminine. Sometimes I am asked to tell what I do in my consulting room to help women return to their wildish natures. I place substantial emphasis on clinical and developmental psychology, and I use the simplest and most accessible ingredient for healing, stories. We follow the patient's dream material, which contains many plots and stories. Speaking of dreams, I had the weirdest, most horrifying dream last night. Fortunately, my psyche has blocked it and I can't remember the details, but it was rather violent and took me by surprise when I woke up. It almost felt like I was watching a violent movie, and yet it came from my own psyche. So that's something I need to start doing, is keeping a dream diary. I, I don't often remember the dreams, but it could be something that reveals. It would be quite interesting. Additionally, I teach a form of powerful interactive trancing that is proximate to Jung's active imagination. And this also produces stories which further elucidate the client's psychic journey. We elicit the wildish self through specific questions and through examining tales, legends and mythos. Most times we are able, over time, to find the guiding myth or fairy tale that contains all the instruction a woman needs for her current psychic development. These stories comprise a woman's soul drama, it is like a play with stage instructions, characterization, and props. The craft of making is an important part of the work I do. Art is important for it commemorates the seasons of the soul or a special or tragic event in the soul's journey. Art is not just for oneself, not just a marker of one's own understanding. It is also a map for those who follow after us. How beautifully put. I do love the way she expresses herself. Stories are medicine. Stories are embedded with instructions which guide us about the complexities of life. I have been taken with stories since I heard my first. They have such power. They do not require that we do, be, act anything. We need only listen. Stories enable us to understand the need for and the ways to raise a submerged archetype. The stories on the following pages are the ones out of hundreds that I've worked with and poured over for decades and that I believe most clearly express the bounty of the wild woman archetype. Sometimes various cultural overlays disarray the bones of stories. For instance, in the case of the Brothers Grimm, among other fairy tale collectors of the past few centuries, there is strong suspicion that the informants, storytellers, of that time sometimes purified their stories for the religious brothers' sakes. Over the course of time, old pagan symbols were overlaid with Christian ones, so that an old healer in the tale became an evil witch, a spirit became an angel, an initiation veil or call became a handkerchief, or a child named Beautiful, the customary name for a child born during Solstice Festival, was renamed Sorrowful. Sexual elements were omitted. Healing creatures and animals were often changed into demons and boogies. 
This is how many women's teaching tales about sex, love, money, marriage, birthing, death and transformation were lost. It is how fairy tales and myths that explicate ancient women's mysteries have been covered over too. Most old collections of fairy tales and mythos existent today have been scoured clean of the scatological, the sexual, the perverse, as in warnings against. The pre-Christian, the feminine, the goddesses, the initiatory, the medicines for various psychological malaises, and the directions for spiritual raptures. But they are not lost forever. Before I carry on, I want to just interject there. Being a mum of two girls, I'm um, reading stories every night, fairy tales. And what grabs me most is, is the fairy tale ending of these tales and how unrealistic they are. And what are we saying to our children by setting them up for failure? Because most relationships, as we know today, do not end in a fairy tale ending with love and marriage. And life is not always as easy as these tales tell. Life is hard. Life is messy. We should be preparing our children rather than setting them up for failure. But they are not lost forever. I was given as a child many of what I know to be unvarnished and uncorrupted themes of the stories of Eld, many of which I bring to this work. But even story fragments as they exist today can foreshadow the shape of the entire story. I've poked about in what I playfully call fairy tale forensics and paleo mythology, even though, as its heart, reconstruction is a long, intricate and contemplative endeavour. Story is far older than the art and science of psychology and will always be the elder in the equation, no matter how much time passes. One of the oldest ways of telling, which intrigues me greatly, is the passionate trance state wherein the teller senses the audience, be it an audience of one or of many, and then enters a state in the world between worlds where a story is attracted to the trance teller and told through her. Sounds fascinating. I've never experienced that. This is a book of tellings about the ways of the wild woman archetype. To try to diagram her, to draw boxes around her psychic life, would be contrary to her spirit. To know her is an ongoing process, a lifelong process, and that is why this work is an ongoing work, a lifelong work. So here are some stories to apply to yourself as soul vitamins, some observations, some map fragments, some little pieces of pine pitch for fastening feathers to trees to show the way, and some flattened underbrush to guide the way back to El Mundo Subterraneo, the underground world, our psychic home. This is a book of women's stories held out as markers along the path. They are for you to read and contemplate in order to assist you toward your own natural one freedom, your caring for self, animals, earth, children, sisters, lovers and men. I'll tell you right now the doors to the world of the wild self are few but precious. If you have a deep scar, that is a door. If you have an old, old story, that is a door. If you love the sky and the water so much you almost cannot bear it, that is a door. If you yearn for a deeper life, a full life, a sane life, that is a door. The material in this book was chosen to embolden you. We must strive to allow our souls to grow in their natural ways and to their natural depths. The wildish nature does not require a woman to be a certain color, a certain education, a certain lifestyle or economic class. In fact, it cannot thrive in an atmosphere of enforced political correctness or by being bent into old, burnt out paradigms. It thrives on fresh sight and self-integrity. It thrives on its own nature. So whether you are an introvert or extrovert, a woman-loving woman, a man-loving woman, or a God-loving woman, or all of the above, whether you are possessed of a simple heart or the ambitions of an Amazon, 
whether you are trying to make it to the top or just make it through tomorrow, whether you be spicy or somber, regal or rough sh or roughshod, the wild woman belongs to you. She belongs to all women. To find her, it is necessary for women to return to their instinctive lives, their deepest knowing. So let us push on now and remember ourselves back to the wild soul. Let us sing her flesh back onto our bones, shed any false coats we may have been given, don the true coat of powerful instinct and knowing, infiltrate the psychic lands that once belonged to us, unfoil the bandages, ready the medicine. Let us return now, wild woman howling, laughing, singing up the one who loves us so. For us, the issue is simple. Without us, wild woman dies. Without wild woman, we die. Para vida, for true life, both must live. Ah, <laughs> Yes to howling the wild woman back into our lives. Oh, so, so exciting, stimulating, encouraging, enthralling, all of these things. Let us begin this journey. And thank you for joining me. I hope to see you again when we go through Chapter 1, Gathering the Bones. Till then, take care and see you soon.